We'll get started with the following. I'll give you a little introduction of myself, and then we'll just sort of go around and I'm going to learn about you, each of you, and then we'll talk about angel investors, okay? So, uh, Sean Robinson, I am currently, the joke I you, uh, the executive director of the Lafayette General Foundation. Uh, so the foundation is a traditional hospital foundation, so we do tables and we do golf outings and we do all that fun stuff to raise money for hospital. But two of the unique things that we have, one is a real estate investment fund where I'm allowed to go out and seek investors for real estate development. And then the third thing we have is an innovation fund. It's a two and a half million dollar seed capital fund. Right? So I'm allowed to look at companies who have some type of health care contingency to them, some type of product or service, right? And, and after their evaluation, uh, or after I take a look at them, we see if we can use them internally, and if we can truly use their product or service, we then sit there and think about making an investment. So there's a whole due diligence process that we go through. And in fact, um, this fund's been around for two years. I'm the second guy to run the fund. Um, but we finally found a company out of New Orleans uh, that we're going to make our first equity investment. And it's a true equity investment. We work with them to negotiate evaluation. We work with them to negotiate board seats. We did all that fun stuff. And now we're going to make a about half a million dollar investment. It's now valued at five million dollars because of our investment, so we own 10% equity. Uh, and we are putting a several year, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars, excuse me, contract with us to use their products and services. So it's a really unique model. We become uh, an equity investor when we know we can use the product and service. And as a $700 million um, system helps us, uh, we also become a fairly large marketplace for products and services. So that's what I do right now. Uh, prior to that, uh, I had a company called Robinson Ventures. Still on it, still alive and kicking. Uh, what it was was managing consulting and equity investing, and primarily in the information technology field. CTO, programmer, I'm a recovering programmer. And when I programmed, it was COBOL, Pascal, Fortran, Basic, not any of that stuff. Maybe COBOL still is being used a little bit here and there, mostly in the financial services industry. But uh, if you ask me to get something, you're in a lot of trouble. So, what I'll do is, again, instead of getting up and doing a full presentation, I'll do a little bit of learning about each other, what you're doing, and then we'll do some QA and, and then talk about it. So, proximity creates. That's right. Uh, Robert Garcia, I'm a small business owner in downtown Lafayette, and uh, my current project is called the Worst Beer Bar. Uh, my name is Eddie Blustris, I'm a business banker with Chase Bank in Lafayette. Uh, I'm always interested in more information on financing options. The joke I use is you and I get to see entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs <laughs> at the same time. And there are more menors than there are entrepreneurs. Right? And, so, uh, <laughs> and so we have to do our fair share of weeding out, and that's why we have great things like the Opportunity Machine and Lita that we can pass the manure potential, hopefully grow some flowers later on, right? Mm -hmm. Type of thing. So uh, I understand. I uh, work at Aaron's. Just skip. Skip Boudreaux. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I work at Aaron's Investment Partners here in Lafayette, uh, but I'm also in the process of developing a uh, fishing device and running with that on the side. Cool. And yeah, what does the, you said an investment fund or? Aaron's Investment Partners. We're a uh, uh, RA. Uh, we manage money for high net worth individuals in stock market. Got it. Josh. Josh was Scott, a uh, full time college student and part time salesman. He's also a student of mine, which I saw walk in and started laughing. Student in Management 380, which is the leadership course. So, in addition to running the foundation, I also am an adjunct professor at UL Lafayette in the management of the Moody School. So, and we can put up with guys like Josh on a pretty good basis. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Jake uh, White. I actually work for AOC and I'm a wannabe screenwriter. Got it. Excellent. Arlene LeBlanc, I do business development for Advantial Federal Credit Union. And I am um, kind of restarting my own business speaker source where I'm engaging professional speakers. 
and Arlene, and again, I do full disclosure. Uh, Arlene in, and um, Advantial are the Federal Credit Union for the Lafayette General Health System, and she was just a wonderful supporter of our gala, where because of her support, we had 100 plus employees able to attend the gala really for the first time. So it's a really neat partnering and underwriting for us. It was awesome. Hi, I'm Betty Meyer. Uh, and for complete disclosure, well, disclosure, disclosure yeah. uh, I am married to uh, the chancellor over at SLCC, Dr. Natalie oh, Moore. Oh, okay. uh, it's actually the reason why we, I'm even here. Um, my career was, uh, I retired at 42, 43 years old. Natalie was taking her career off and she got the opportunity to come here. And so I thought I was really going to be retired. It lasted three months and then I went over to UL Lafayette <laughs> and, and ran two computer science based research centers for two years okay. before going over. So. Yeah, at least the reason why we're here. Okay. Uh, we're going to go down the next row and introduce ourselves. I'm Marissa uh, yeah. Collins. I am the engagement and outreach officer for the Moody College of Business here at UL Lafayette um, and on the steering committee for so It's all like this. It sometimes yeah. feels like <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm uh, Monique and I'm a student at the Moody College of Business. <laughs> Excellent. 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 Somebody else has their mic on again. Thank you. Go ahead, sorry. Shaking their head, yes. So, somebody tell me what is an angel investor and what do they look like? They look like anybody. Everybody. There's no definition. <laughs> so, anybody in this room can be an angel investor, but there's really two, uh, two pieces that you need to know. They have to have a qualified angel investor. A qualified angel investor has to have a, an income of about 300 grand a year or more. It's an annual income of 300 grand, it's sort of a net worth of a million plus. They have to have the ability to invest in your company. But that said, as Mr. Trout said, it can be anyone. And angel investors start off as the FF and F group, which stands for friends, families, or family members, and fools at the same time as the joke. Right? So more often than not, when you're starting your, your company up, you turn to the folks that you know the best, and, and it's your friends and your family. You sit there and you talk to them about what's going on. But at the same time, uh, so we talk about qualified angels. So we talk in really qualified angels, 300 grand or more a year, and a uh, million dollar net worth. Uh, where do you find angels? Okay, so throw FF and F away. Get rid of FF and F. Where do you, where do you find angels? They just sort of, I'm not talking going to church, right? Now I'm going to church and, 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 doing, and doing, what I call them pure aerobics, right? Kneeling and praying and then up and standing. Okay, uh, where do you find them? Where are they? Hmm? Craigslist. <laughs> so, 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 uh, not the best place to find angels. Okay. Uh, so where are they? Okay. Sure. So sometimes what you can do is you will find them at law firms and accounting firms. All right. So law firms and accounting firms. Come on up front. We're not formal private. We're sort of having a little chat. So law offices and accounting firms will know who they are. Why? Because that's right, right? So let's make it simple. It's because they know their numbers. And more often than not, they're, they're, they're representing them. Right? So before they make an investment, they're going to go to their lawyer or their accountant and seek their advice. You also uh, can go to, if you have in the room, bankers. So 
So sometimes bankers uh, will know who are qualified to be investors are. But often, there are communities of them. So here in southern Louisiana, there's an angel network in New Orleans. There's an angel network in City Lake Charles. And hopefully soon, here in Lafayette, part of what Innovate's doing is putting together an angel investment network here to do some of that. So it's a professional. And these angels, when they join these organizations, they pay in a membership fee. Okay? They pay to belong to part of the network. And the reason is, is because there are there are staff members in that network who then, once those business plans come in, do the due diligence and say they're entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. The menors get referred to the folks like Lita and UL, and you have some services that are free because of what they do for the community. But if they're qualified, then they get to come in and they get a pitch, and they get to pitch to these these folks, and then these folks choose to invest. So. Yeah, thank you to get so, so apparently there's a bunch of live bikes running around. Um, and so um, what do angel how do angel investors choose what they invest in? Personal interest. Very good. It's exactly right. They invest in what they know. So if you're going to you've got somebody who's come up to you and said they're interested in your business and it's an IT business and it's an IT business in the healthcare industry, and they're oil and gas people, it's a harder sell. They're not gonna know a lot of what's going on, and so there is an educative process that you have to engage in like you wouldn't believe. And so angel investors, more often than not, invest in their interests, invest in what they know, invest where they made their money, right? That's how they're angels. So how, what, what else do they invest? Why else do they invest? How else do they choose to their investment? So, they're going to look at the, the potential. So let's let's put that away for a minute, right? Just before you even get it, one of the things that an angel investment, an angel does, is they invest as a social function. Right? So they invest in what they know and they try to do that, but then they also invest it as a social function. Right? So in these angel networks, one, one angel comes in and says, okay, I'm going to do the deal. Well, now they've got three, four, five other buddies because these angel networks are social networks. And they're like, I'm going, hmm. Why did he invest? Let's talk about it. And so it becomes a very much a social function of what they do. And so you've got, you've got them looking at what they know, then their girlfriends and buddies get in, and they, they, now they're, they're investing in, in, in that social function. But what are they truly investing in? Very good. You. That's exactly right. I'm going to say you, but it's at the top of my sheet. It's a big exclamation point. It says you. Right? That's what they're investing in. They're investing in the individual. Right? They're investing in that. So it becomes very important uh, that when you meet these angels, you're ready to go. And you can't, you know, there is very, very few opportunities to make a second impression. I think this is the best way to right? So they invest in you. What do they invest in? They invest in what they know it's a social function. Um, so we define an angel, uh, we define how we find them. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stop, and you know, once I get done with a few more minutes, I'm going to stop, and then we're going to just do some Q&A. All right? So when you pitch, you have to be prepared. You have to have your homework done. Right? You have to be ready to answer the questions that they're going to have for you. So it's, uh, there's a great quote. It's, it's, ne it's never more embarrassing moment than when you realize in the middle of a, of a meeting or a presentation that you haven't done your homework. Right? Um, are you selling your product or service to the angel, or are you selling the company? Selling yourself. Okay. So you got past the you part, Josh, right? So you sold yourself, and now you sold you, who you are. They're, they're, they're feeling comfortable. They're feeling good. Now what's next? Right? Is product or company? The company. The company. It's absolutely the company, right? So they're going to look at structures. They're going to look at finances. They're going to start going in and asking you for that information. Eventually, they're going to get to the, the what, right? And so I don't know. Uh, you, ever, you ever hear of a guy named Simon Sinek? The circle, right? It's like a giant fried egg. Okay? 
many people try to sell the what, the product. You sell the why first and foremost, right? Must sell the why, right? You get at it, and it, and it gets into the, this is, again, the weirdness of the way we are being human. humans. There's two parts to your brain, right? There's the emotive brain and then the rational brain. And more often than not, people sit there and say, if you, if you ever want to see an excellent, this guy's name is Simon Sinek. It does this. About a seven minute to 10 minute presentation of the TED Talk. And it gets into why Apple's so successful. Apple's so successful because they sell great design, right? They sell a lot. The what is it happens to be a computer, uh, a piece of software that helps you manage your music, the, the technology to deliver that, and it's great design, right? So you sell the why first. That's why you go first you, then the company, and then the product or service is how you move through it. So you're absolutely selling the company. You're not pitching them your product. Too many times I've seen people come up in front of angels and start selling them their product or service. They're not there to buy your product or service. They're there to buy your company. And they're right, and then eventually you're talking about your product or service. All right. Um, the other thing that folks for, uh, forget is that angels are also going to want to know your exit, their exit. Why do you want to know the exit? Why do they want to know their exit? Okay, why else would they want to know what their exit strategy is? Your exit strategy is, right? So you come up, you sold you, you sold the company, you sold the product or service, they're good, they're bought in, right? Why do they want to know how you're going to, you, you're going to sell the company? How are you going to get out? What's that strategy? What are they, why? Why do they want to know that? So they get paid. Exactly, right? So that you sell the exit because at some point in time they need their money back. It's that simple. Right? And so you, you have no exit strategy that says, I'm going to build this company. Uh, it's three to five year build period. Uh, I'm looking for a half million dollar investment up front. It's going to get me that, that. I think we can get these, this much return. And I expect to sell it to a bigger company, continue to run it. At some point in time, there's an exit, not only for you, but for them. Yeah. All right? So you must, 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 must talk about your exit strategy when you're talking about being So how do you prepare to present? So you're getting ready to present to the angel, right? You're getting ready to talk to them. You're just gonna go willy-nilly walk up to them? What are you gonna do first? Look in the mirror. So that's practicing. So first, Josh likes to start apparently with the mirror, okay? <laughs> And then who do you then who do you go to? Very good. You go to the FF. Well, first you want to go to friends and family. You don't want to present and practice the fools. Very bad, right? It's very very bad, right? It's the joke of these. You go to F and F, right? And so when I started Robinson Ventures back in the early two thousands, I, I didn't have to go seek financing, right? That, I was very blessed. I was able to hold out a shingle, and suddenly I had seven clients within two weeks. It was very very fortuitous, right? But I had to practice my pitch, and I had this great lady who I've been married to for a certain period of time, who was going to rip me a new one when I was wrong, right? Because she's contractually obligated to, because I stood before God and church and everything like that. So she's allowed to be as harsh as she wants to be. For love, a lot of love, right? All of goodness. And so I practiced, and practiced, practiced, practiced. And you're not only practicing your pitch. Practicing your Q&A and expect squirrely questions. Because the joke I use is when I teach at UL, I teach 320 leadership, the phrase I use is people are wiggly. They're wonderful, but they're wiggly. Right? And you're going to get all kinds of squirreliness that comes at you. You've got to prepare for the squirreliness. So go find your harshest, weirdest friend and give them a great pitch, and then you're gonna get the squirreliest responses back and you're gonna be ready to go. Um, the other thing that I've seen way too many times is, right, so the joke I use is everybody thinks success, right, is linear, right? Everybody looks like success. That's the, that's the line for success. 
You start here and you end here, right? Oop, not at R. Hopefully not at R. Hopefully you just have to go to B. Okay. Success really looks like this, right? All over the damn show until you get up to here, right? Because if you're a good entrepreneur, you're going to fail at least once or twice. The really good entrepreneurs are serial entrepreneurs because they know that they're going to fall on their heads repeatedly. It's not if you fail, it's how you get back up and keep going, right? And so that's what success looks like. But should your pitch look like that? Well, hell no. Your pitch should never look like that, right? You have to have a clear path from A to B, right? Too many times I've been in presentations, I don't know about you all who are commercial banking or been in commercial banking or banking, when you get somebody come in and they're trying to get you to give them a loan in their company or give them a loan for their house or whatever it is, and they do this. They're all over the damn show. And so you have to have them really outlined. And so when you go to pitch, it is that, it's, it's gotta be that dead solid part. It's gotta be, this is, this is who I am, this is what the company is, these are our products and services, Here's how, here's, here's, here's what I need from you, and here's how I plan to get out at a certain period of time. Do, 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 do. And so this afternoon, when we collapse all these walls and we start, I get to be a judge. Now the fun part is I get to talk to you today, that's great. But the fun part really is, is when I get to sit down and judge these 12 companies that get up there. And this is the stuff I'm looking at. What does it look like? We've already judged their, their uh, they, they submitted a business Piece, right? A little two to three page business document that we've got to judge. Now we get to judge the PowerPoints of the presentations. And this is the stuff I'm looking for. Um, and at the end of the day, it is you that they're investing in, but it's also your people. Okay? It's also your people. So here's some of the company characteristics that angels look for, right? The company characteristics. They're gonna look at your team. It may be a team of one, was it the army of one, was the, the back in the day, right? Maybe I'm dating myself, right? Team of one, it may be you. So if you're an IT person and you're selling a beauty products company, how are you getting them from I'm an IT guy to I'm selling beauty products, right? They have to have confidence in the team, the expertise. And so one of the great ways is say it's just you. You're the team of one, right? And so you're the IT, again, I, I'm an angel investor and what do I know? I know IT and software, so I'm gonna constantly run with the mama and know IT and software. So there's the examples I'll give you all, right? So, I was starting a company that still exists. It's called 360 Professional Services Group in Buffalo, New York. They're web app development, website development, and custom software, right? And so what we were getting it was a team of three. Me, and two, a, a database guy, and a software guy, right? So we go to seek funding. And specifically, this time, we were going to traditional funding, it was a bank. And what was great was the two guys that were my partners in this at the time were 23 and 24. And I was not 23 and 24, okay? Right? And when I walked in, the bank looked at us and said, it's good to have an adult in the room. It was the first statement out of their mouth. Because they would have said if it was a 23 and 24 year old walking in there, they would have been like, no way. But then we also handed them our packet, which, hi, I'm the adult, apparently. These are these guys, and, and one guy had a, a degree, right? He had a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Computer Science from Buffalo, University of Buffalo. The software programmer had a high school diploma, right? Well, oh, P.S., that guy's now the CEO, but, right? And we made that decision as investors. And what I did was I put about, a, I was the third owner in it, I put my equity in to get it started up. They bought me out the 5% lottery ticket, which is kind of where I hang out right now. And they're an $8 million lifestyle business. Right? They hang out, they do $8 million of business a year, eventually they'll be sold, and I'll have my five points, and I had my debt to equity conversion occurred. Anyway, but also on that list, you know what we had? We had our CFO, who was an accounting firm. We had a law firm on there. We had all of our team built out, so you may be a team of one, but you have to show competency. 
And so build out your team and you can use consultants, you can use banks, you can use lawyers, you can use accountants. So they're buying the team. Most angels look for disruptive or innovative products. If you're just another version of that which has been done over and over and over again, it's a whole hop. Right? So, your bar? It's a beer bar. A beer bar, okay. It's a Okay, go ahead. Not your ordinary, everyday beer bar. Okay. It's a beer garden attached to a park, next to a park, next to a park and garage and part of downtown like that. Okay. So what he's trying to do is, since it's not really truly disruptive, it's innovative or innovative. It's a bit disruptive. Okay. And so your argument could be to me, oh, it is disruptive and innovative. Well, I'm going to, again, that's what I'll come and I've never run a bar or a beer garden before, so I'm not going to know if it is or it isn't. So I would look to my buddy, who is the restaurant entrepreneur, to come to you and say, and then he comes to me and says, his, and I'm going to put money in. And then I'm like, okay, well, you know, here's my wheelbarrow. I'll dump it over here for a second and see. And do I get free beer in the beer garden because I'm an investor? This is awesome. Right? Okay? So they're looking for innovation and disruption. Right? Larger growing market is also what folks are looking for. So what's a large and growing market right now? Let's pick one. So tech. Would you say tech? If that's right, I said it. Yeah. Uh, what did you say, Marissa? I said tech. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So technology, absolutely. Healthcare, large and growing market. And tech, I'm going to pick on Dr. VJ. Tech and big data. Right. So so technology, absolutely. Um, healthcare, large and growing market. Energy, despite what we're going on, large and growing market. Right? So there are several large and growing markets. Here's the other thing I'm going to encourage you. Don't be a solution looking for a problem. Too many entrepreneurs come in and they're all about a solution. This is what I've created. And I'm like, well, what's your market? What problem are you solving? Uh, right? Don't be a solution looking for a problem. Go find and define the problem and then create the solution. Right? Go find and define the marketplace and the problem and then create the solution. Traction. Angels don't like to invest alone. It's good to not be pre-revenue. Um, we tend to like to see you try, you've got skin in the game on yourself, right? And you've got a little bit of revenue. You're showing your revenue. Even if you're pre-revenue, you're damn close to revenue. Okay, so some traction in the marketplace. At the end of the day, angels are profit motivated. And so they want to see the profit potential. So if you sit there and say, I'm going to take your half a million dollars and I'm going to turn it into a million dollars, right? Normally, so the fund that I run, we're patient money. So we want to see 5 to 10x. Most angels are not one 5 to 10x. So we're going to 10x plus ROI on their money. So back here. Mr. Chapman's going to your, your statement. Though. They are looking for a return on investment, so they are looking for profit. Okay? Scalability, what does that mean? They'll, look at, they'll sit in there and say, is your model, is your business scalable? Is your beer garden scalable? Right. What does that mean? Huh? Growth. growth potential, right? So they're looking at growth potential. So how do you determine scalability? Where's, where's your scalability come from? And it's not only growth potential in terms of here's the marketplace. It's how your business model scales. Okay, so we're going back to economic supply and demand. That's the marketplace. We're looking at what we're doing as angels. Is we're specifically looking at how that business growth, but growth through the operation, oper, oper, somebody help me out, operate, relationalizing. That's so how do you use operations also to the growth and scale it, right? So if I'm a management consulting company and I'm a management consulting company of one and I've got my professional advisors and I'm going after a multi-million dollar contract with a company, what's my scalability issue? Very good, it's bodies. And it becomes payroll. Right? And so now, say I do get that million and a half dollar contract. I can go to the banks and say, hey, give me a lock, give me a line of credit. I've got a million and a half, three year dollar, three, it's 500 grand a year, three years. I need to, in order to deliver it, I need to go from one to five. I don't have the cash to do it. Line of credit. 
put up a little credit card, I guess you could say, some debt that sits out there that you're able to pay. Angels will do that. So same thing that the banks say, ah, we don't want it. Some of the reasons why you look for angels, angels do that. They'll sit there and say, oh, you got a million and a half dollars today. Okay. I'll give you gas in the tank. Maybe that gas in the tank, and there's different vehicles. There's different investment vehicles. Okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. So they're looking for scalability. How does that company go from zero to not zero? And how does it ramp up? And so is it bodies? Right? That's a scalability issue. Is it access to marketplaces? That's a scalability issue. Right? Is it access to technology? Also scalability issue. Right? So you're going to have to mitigate and tell angels, this is how I'm going to go from being a zero company to a billion dollar company in 10 years. Okay. And then I already talked about the exit. So. You can go and get two types of stuff. Two types of stuff. There you go. Two types of investments for angels. Debt. I'm dyslexic, right? I'm a dys so I'll you just I'll spell words backwards. It's great. Students of mine are, are like I'm like is this is spelled right. Somebody help me with the spelling. Right? So debt and equity. Yeah. Real simple. Angels will do. Anybody know what kind of debt there is out there from angels? Anybody want to take a shot at that? No? Okay, so there's straight up debt. Right? It's a percentage. I want to see 12% return on my money over a three month period, 12 month period, a three year period. And I would do that often. I would come in as an angel investor and say, hey, you guys need $100,000? Great, I like your company, we've done the due diligence. I'm going to give you a loan. But, so that's a standard loan. And so what I would do is say also, oh, by the way, if I really like what you're doing on that loan, you don't have to pay me back. I'm going to convert it. So it's called convertible debt to equity. And there's a conversion ratio that's in there. So in the loan documents, it's three years. If you're 100 grand, you have to pay me 18% interest over three years. At the end of those three years, your company's doing what it says it's going to be doing. I really like it. I can then take all the money, the principal plus the interest, and at a reduced rate, usually I, I, I said somewhere around a 50 to 75% reduced rate. So if the, if the membership unit or share was $100, I was able to buy in at 50 to $75, right, in that range. So I would be able to buy at a reduced rate, which gave me more equity. Right, but it got you gas in the tank. So angels would come in and just do straight up debt. It's like a loan, it's a note. Or they'll do convertible debt. And then there's equity. And that is simply half a million dollars. Your company, we agreed the valuation is $5 million. We get 10%. Now the trouble with that is if they come in and they take on debt, we're not the first folks at the trough. Should they go toes up? The banks are. Workforce commission is if they have to pay uh, salaries and stuff like that. And so more often than not, we negotiate preferred equity, preferred shares or units. And again, shares and units differ. Units, usually LLCs in terms of the corporate membership units. Shares are more like an S Corp or a C Corp or something like that. And I'm not a lawyer, but I play one on TV. So. Right, so 10%, that's equity and debt. So I have 10 minutes left. This is the little flash card I got. What question? I don't want to, I'm tired of talking. Question, sir. Well, you didn't have all the patents and all the other Mm-hmm. That's important. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. <clears throat> right? So, I, I, you know, say I want to invest in the beer garden. He does not have any patents or intellectual property, right? He's just a nice business. There are some companies we'll hear from today that will have applied for patents and will have applied for intellectual property. And some angels value that, some angels don't. As the innovation fund, um, the first equity investment we're making in this company, they don't have any patents. Um, their intellectual property is locked in the heads of their employees. Uh, and they negotiated a really neat deal with a worldwide multi-billion dollar company whose product or service, whose, whose software package they're going to implement as their own product and service. 
So in that instance, we're depending upon a, a third party intellectual property. But we know who they are and we're fairly confident in that. Other question? So I'm going to punt and say I'm not in the fashion industry. I'm IT and management consulting. So take this with that big old grain of salt that it's about to come with. Um, I would look to other successful business owners and seek their advice. So if you're looking to open up a fashion consultancy to help people find their fashion style and, and consult with them, there are other people already doing that. And so you can talk to them about that. Um, there are, you know, th that's the best. I, I always look for peak swimming buddies, right? When I, what I mean by that is, you know, you don't go in the water by yourself, you're trying to find a swimming buddy. And so you go and you sit there and say, who else is in the fashion industry? Who else can I talk to? Um, you're a UL student, so I would go to the resources at UL Lafayette. So alumni associations are a great way to find out who are graduates, who are Cajuns, who are in the industry. So go and use the resources that are at your hand as a student. So I go talk to those folks. I'm going to pick on Marisa because she's in the business department. There's lots of good people in the business department. There's lots of professors in the business department. They may have a fashion expertise. So, you're welcome. Sir. Uh, when you develop a pro forma for a potential investor, okay. um, what are some of your thoughts on uh, you know, projecting realistic sales goals and being able to back those up and you know, make it you know, you want to show the range, or do you want to show your goal, or do you want to show what you've done, or? All right, so if you have revenue, show revenue, yeah. is what I would say, right? And people are smart enough to know that if you've been in business for a year, you're now seeking investors, and your business is you know, generating $150,000 last year in beer sales, and food sales, and event sales, I don't know what else maybe you have thrown around in there. Um, it's good to show that. The, the, the mistake people make is it's, a, it, it's either range, it's a balancing act. The, they come in and they say, oh, we're going to be a hockey stick, right? The hockey stick curve, right? So this is your revenue projection and you start off like this and wee, right? Woohoo, we're going to be a million dollar beer garden in, you know, three years. No, right? But are you more along the lines of, you know, nice, steady growth with maybe some flattening unless you franchise? or have some other model that way? Yes. So be realistic in your projections. Don't over project. At the, at the same time, you don't want to flat line out the, <laughs> out the door for an angel, right? Oh, I don't think I'm going to grow for three years. Okay, I'm out. I'm out. Done. So be realistic. Yeah. Be realistic. And tie it back to your research. Do your homework and tie it back to your research. Because if you've shown that you know, you've only been open a month or two and you have $150,000 in sales, you know, are you going to continue at that rate? Is that a realistic rate? Is it just the new excitedness that the marketplace has? So know your marketplace and be able to tie those projections very hard back to the statistics of the data that you pull together in your homework. Um, this is what killed the dot-com era. All these people coming in and showing the hockey stick curve. And it's even worse. I mean, this is IT. I've seen the hockey stick curve in oil and gas, and it's like this. Right? And most OG oil and gas investors want that. Right? They don't like dry holes. The only dry holes is bad. They're very bad. Okay? And so their hockey stick curve is 18 to 24 months. Maximum. I mean, it's we're gonna put it in the ground, you know it's in the ground, we'll put my money in, we're gonna pay for that hole to go in, and now I'm expecting money to come out. I'm selling barrels or I'm selling cubic feet. So know your industry too. Right? So oil and gas, IT, I don't know. It, healthcare, depending on what product or service, it can be like this, or it's more along the lines of this, and this is caused by the FDA. <laughs> right? Yeah. Any other questions? No? What, uh, what qualities do you, do you recommend that uh, someone seeking an angel investor look for 
in the person, not their wealth, their ability to finance you. Get. What a great question, and thank you for touching on that. Not only do you want the angel's money, you want their network. You want the fact that they're proud that they're investing in a company, and then they're going to take you around to the 30 other people they look for. So for Lafayette General, our process is, I'm the menor preneur filter, right? I see all these people all the time. So I determine you're not an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur, and then I begin my due diligence process, which is, I don't know some of this stuff, so I bring subject matter experts from within the health system. It might be an orthopedic surgeon, it might be our compliance people, it might be our finance person, right? So I bring in those folks. And then once you get through those folks, I, we then start talking about due diligence on the business itself. And so it's a bifurcation at that point in time. I'm looking at the business and I'm getting back together with those subject matter experts to determine, yes, it's true. You get through that process at the other end, you go to committee. And it's the investment committee. The investment committee looks at that. And the investment committee is the CEO, the chairman, the CEO of the system, David Calicod, our general counsel, Gordon Roundtree, our, our CFO, EVP, Roger Mackey, our chairman of the board, Clay Allen, myself, and a guy named Jared Quiser, who sits on the foundation board. And Jared is a, a senior VP with the Intel Corporation. He's director of the America's Marketplace, right? So I bring this investment team together, plus the subject matter expert, whomever they may be, and we determine if we want to invest in you or not, and then we negotiate. But the most important part is at that point in time, we're also looking at the fact that we're going to be using your products and services internally. So I would say to you, you want a partner as your angel. You want them to maybe even buy their product or service, but at minimum, um, their network. And so with this company we're making an investment in, we're already putting a strategy together that David Calicott, our CEO, is going to take them out to 20 other health systems in the next 12 months and make those introductions for this company. Why? Win-win. Hmm? Win-win. By the way, now I own 10% of them, and if they go from being a $250,000 company to a $25 million company, I can drive that, my equity becomes more valuable, they get noticed in the marketplace, and their exit strategy, which we already know, which is they're going to be bought by the company they're partnered with, they're going to have, and they, do it, they usually do it 3x. In this instance, it's 3x gross revs. So my half million dollars on a $75 million buyout, I'm kind of happy at that point in time. Because as a non-profit 501c3, I'm not going to, I'm not going to woohoo, and I'm going out and partying as the foundation. No, what I'm doing is I'm plowing it back, I'm reinvesting it into the health system. So as a foundation, I plow into new MRIs, I put it in my endowment, and then I go seek other companies to go invest in. And we continue the process of the cycle. So a really blathering answer, but you're looking for not only money, but for networks and partnership, and then help their help growing the company. Awesome question. Absolutely, yeah. are they mentoring? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. want somebody that you can get along with. The worst thing is having an activist angel, an activist investor. They will cause more problems for you. And I've been just given the, I've been given the hook. So, if we have time out there, great. And after the presentation, great. Thank you so much for this afternoon. Thank you.